If you would go ahead and find in your Bibles Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, and uh, we'll be reading from uh, verse 10 down to verse 12. And when you stand, or when you find that, you can stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Acts chapter 9, beginning at verse 10, and this is what it says. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. I want you to read again, verse 11, notice what it says. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarshish. Listen, for behold, he prayeth. You may be seated. I have titled the message tonight, Saul's Emergency, Acts 9-1-1. Saul's Emergency. Now, as we look at this message, I've, I've been studying over several different times, and, and uh, Saul, and for the sake of the message and where we at, I, I'll probably use Saul and Paul interchangeably at times because I'm just so used to calling him Paul, but at this time, he is Saul, who later becomes the great apostle Paul, as we all know and love, but so you'll have to forgive me if I, if I happen to say one name or the other. I'm talking about the same guy, so cut me a little slack there along the message. This is the same guy that we'll be talking about. Now, as I was reading over this, there, apart from uh, Jesus, of course, this is one of the biggest characters we see in the New Testament. I mean, much of your New Testament was written by the Apostle Paul. My understanding is, is 14 books of the New Testament were written by the Apostle Paul. That's pretty amazing if you think about how God used him. I mean, just to write one would be an incredible thing, but he's uh, got 14 different books of the Bible. That's a man used mightily by God. And uh, But apart from Jesus, Paul, he still stands out in, a, in an incredible way, but he didn't always begin as the great Apostle Paul that we know and love today. He started out much differently, and so I want to talk about that a little bit tonight as we go on. Now, we started in at, uh, at the place where uh, the Lord was speaking to Ananias, but in order to understand where we're at, we need to take a few steps back uh, to the beginning of this ninth chapter of Acts. So uh, what I'll have you do is you're just going to nail your Bible open to Acts. Acts chapter 9 tonight. I'll mention a few other places as we go, but this is where we're going to be. Amen? So the first thing that I want to point out in this message is that we see in the beginning of this, we see a man that is on a mission. We're going to see a man that is on a mission, and this mission is a, a mission of fear and death. This mission that, that Saul is on is a mission of fear and death. Look at what it says in the first verse of Acts chapter 9. It says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. Now, this was the consuming passion of this man. He wanted to stamp out all the followers of Jesus Christ. He hated Jesus Christ. He hated everyone that believed in that way. Every breath that he took was in furtherance of, of threatening and slaughter, trying to find those who, who uh, loved Jesus, who followed Jesus. He hated them. He was a heart that was consumed with hatred and murder for these people. This is the man that we're going to be looking at here that we see. This is Saul, and we see that in this first verse. In fact, Saul was even present and consenting to the murder of Stephen, the, the martyr of Stephen. We find that over in Acts chapter 7 and verse 15. Listen to what it says there. It says, And they cast him out of the city, speaking of Stephen, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And so there he is. He's at the stoning of Stephen. He sees Stephen. He's going to be put to death. And Saul is there. And he's holding the coats of these people. Uh, the apostle Paul talks about it again in Acts chapter 22 verse 20. He says this. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. So 
So here we see a man that, that he has this in his heart. He wants to destroy people. He hates Jesus. He hates those that are following Jesus. He's going to go out and do whatever he can in his misdirected zeal that he thinks he is doing God a service, but he's truly not. And he's going out and he desires to, to destroy these people. Now let's look at verses 1 and 2 of this chapter. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, it says this, he went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Now, can you see this man who's on a mission? Can you see Saul who is on a mission? His desire, there is hatred in his heart, there is murder in his heart. He desires to stamp out those followers of Jesus Christ. Can you see a man on a mission? You see that he has letters in his hand, he has papers in his hand as he's leaving, he's beginning to walk out. He has authority given to him from those from the high priest it says you go wherever you can find them take them it doesn't matter if they're male or female you bring them and we'll put them to death basically that's what he's headed out to do can you see this man this is Saul. This is the man. It, this doesn't sound like the same guy that we know, but this is how he began. This is who he was. This is Saul. He is on a mission of fear and death. He's on his way to Damascus. He's got the letters in his hands, and he's got murder in his heart. Now, the next thing I want you to look at is look at a mission that was compromised. He's on a mission. He's got papers in hand. He's got the authority, but we're going to see that a mission is compromised here. There's something that happens. Look at verse 3. It says, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined right about him a light from heaven. I love that that it says, and suddenly. And you say, well, what is this light? I believe that it was the glory of God that's shining right about him. I believe that the glorified, risen Son of Almighty God, Jesus Christ, rent the heavens and he looked down at Saul and the glory shone on him and it was so powerful it knocked Saul to the ground. The glory of God. The heavens were ripped apart. I believe that Jesus looked down and, and, and it was so bright it knocked him to the ground. Suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. I want to tell you that this was an ambush. It was a Jesus ambush. Is it, is, this was a Jesus ambush. We have a man on a mission. He's a mission of fear and death. And all of a sudden the heavens, they, they rip open and Jesus looks down on him and it knocks him to the ground. He was ambushed by Jesus Christ. How amazing is that? His mission was compromised. Look at, uh, you say, well, how do you know that he's seen Jesus? Look at uh, verse 27 of Acts chapter 9. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken unto him. Now that's pretty clear, wouldn't you say? He had seen the Lord in the way. So we know that Jesus is that light, that Jesus is the one. The Bible talks about that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. We know that that glory of God, he talks about it in Acts 22. He says, I could not see for the glory of that light. Saul is talking about something that was more powerful than even the light of the sun that shined down and that, that knocked him to the ground. It was, it was something he'd never experienced before. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. God Almighty was ripping open, open the heavens and saying, Saul, you're about to find out who I really am. Think about it. A man on a mission. A mission is compromised. Look at what it says in verse 4. And he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Wow. Could you imagine hearing that? Put yourself in, in Saul's shoes for a moment. You think you're on your way doing service to God. You think you're on your way doing the right thing. You think you're, you're going out doing good and then all of a sudden you are knocked to the ground. The glory of God shines around you and you hear a voice that says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He knew this was something supernatural. That doesn't happen every day. This was something supernatural that was happening. Now, I want you to realize this, too, that, see, Saul was very religious. In fact, he thought he was doing God a service, but all of a sudden, everything that, that he thought he knew was about to fall apart. 
It was about to fall apart. I want you to recognize that his understanding was confronted with truth. His understanding was confronted with truth. Over in Acts chapter 26, verse 9, this is what uh, Saul said as I was talking about the note. He thought he was doing God a service. Listen to what he says. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. That was what, that was what he thought he was doing right. He said, I thought within myself that I was doing the right thing. But suddenly his understanding was confronted with truth. Let's read that verses 4 through 6. And he fell off to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Now I want you to know that he saw a light. He was knocked to the ground. He heard a voice, and he asked this question, Who are you? To his complete astonishment, you just read it there in verse 6, he trembling and astonished. He is completely astonished. The voice did not say, I am Jehovah. It didn't say, I am that I am. He didn't say, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, though he was all these things. He didn't say, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi. He didn't go into any of that stuff. You know what he says? I am Jesus. He could have said any of those other things, but he wanted Saul to know exactly who was talking to him. Think about that. He could have said anything he wanted, but he said, listen, Saul, I am Jesus. I want you to know that God revealed himself to Saul that day, the Lord Jesus Christ. His understanding was confronted with the truth. Now let's look at the next portion of this. I want you to know that he responded to the truth and was transformed. Isn't that, isn't that what we all must do? We're confronted with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and uh, we, we hear the word of God preached to us and our understanding is opened up and we must respond to the truth that we're confronted with. Every one of us, you, you can't hear the truth of God's word presented to you and, and not be changed in some way. You'll harden yourself or you'll open yourself to it. But, but when you're confronted with truth, you have to respond in some way. And he responded and was transformed. Look at verse 6 again. And trembling and astonished, he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Now, a few minutes ago, he called him Lord, which is, is as if he, was, he didn't quite know who he was talking to yet. He was saying, Sir. But now, he says, I am, Jesus tells him, he says, I am Jesus who thou persecutest. And his, uh, his uh, response is, oh, wait a minute. You're Jesus? And he says, now, Lord, God, I thought I knew you, Lord. But suddenly, he's confronted with the truth. Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to notice that he is, he is obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ, even at this point. He has is, he is changed, he has transformed, he suddenly has this revelation of who Jesus Christ is, who God is, and he's confronted with this, and now he's obedient to the Lord. And he says, Lord, what will you have me to do? Lord, what will you have me to do? He's responding to this truth. He's being transformed. Now, I want you to notice something else. As I was reading this, uh, there were others around that day. There were others around that day. Look at verse 7. It says, and the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. So there were others around him that day that, that, that seen uh, these things happening. Now, uh, Paul talks about this again in Acts chapter 22. And listen to what he says in verse 9 of Acts chapter 22. It says, and they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid. But they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. And now you say, wait a minute. Just a moment ago, it says that the men stood speechless with their mouths hanging open, right? 
what just happened. It says that they hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And then over here in the 22nd chapter, it says, they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. Now you say, well, there's a contradiction here. No. These men heard the sound of the voice. They heard the noise, but they didn't comprehend what was said. They heard the sound of it, but Saul, Paul is saying they heard the noise, they heard the sound of it, but they didn't comprehend what was being told. They didn't comprehend what was being said that day. They saw the light, they heard the sound of the voice, but they had no understanding of what was said. That's because the message was for Saul. Does that make sense? God was revealing himself to Saul. He had opened Saul's understanding. He, was, he struck him down on that Damascus road and said, you're going to know who I am whether you like it or not. Listen to how Paul talks about it before King Agrippa in the 26th chapter of Acts. In verses 13 and 14, he says, At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. When we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And that means a sharp object on the end of a stick. They use it to push the ox around, to, to push him along. And, and he's saying, it's hard for you to kick against that. It's hard for you to kick against my proddings. Hmm? So these around, they seen the light. They fell to the ground, but they did not comprehend it. They heard a voice. They were speechless, but they did not understand what they heard. They did not see or know the one who was speaking. On the, on the other side of that, Saul seen the light of the glory of God. He seen the one speaking. He fell to the ground. He understood what was said. Why? Because the message was for him. See, Saul, he seen, he heard, and comprehended because God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, revealed himself to him that day on the Damascus Road. That's amazing. That's amazing. Now, I want you to notice this, that his mission was changed. He's still going to Damascus, but his mission has changed. But the details were unclear. They were cloudy. Let's read this. Uh, let's read uh, verses 6 through 8 again. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city. It shall be told thee what thou must do. See, he's still going to the city. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth. When his eyes, uh, when his eyes were open, he saw no man, but they, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. When he got up, he was blind. That glory of God, so bright, above the brightness of the sun, he gets up and he doesn't see anything. He's been blinded. And I thought about this. It's amazing how this one who was breathing out threatenings and slaughter, who was going to homes, maybe kicking door down, doors down, uh, wherever he could go to find people who are following Jesus. This, this man, this one that had that evil in his heart and that murder in his heart, now he is having to be led by the hand like a child. Those that are with him are leading him by the hand. How he was humbled that day. Think about that. How he was humbled in that moment. They're having to lead him by the hand. He can't see. Now we come to Saul's emergency. It says in verse 9, And he was three days without sight, neither did he eat nor drink. And in verse 11, as we read earlier, the end of that verse says, Behold, he prayeth. Now, I don't know what all was said during those prayers. The Bible doesn't record it for us. But I want you to think about something just for a moment. The Saul's question to the Lord was, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? His question that he asked Jesus in the way, Lord, what will you have me to do? I want you to remember that Saul had a lot going for him. He, you know, he had power. He had the notoriety. He had the prestige. He, had, he was well-educated by the finest teachers. 
He spoke several languages. I don't know how many languages, but I know it was several different languages he spoke. He, he held an office in the Sanhedrin. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, he talks about at one point in the scriptures. He was the best and the brightest. As far as those around him are concerned, he's number one. The best among us. He keeps the law the best. He does everything just the right way. He knows all about it. He does it just the perfect way. He's the guy. But it was all brought to nothing. All brought to nothing that day on the Damascus Road. Everything that he had known, that he had worked for, the, the uh, fame, the whatever that people thought about him, everything that he was in that moment as, as Saul of Tarshish, everything that he was in that moment was brought down to nothing when Jesus struck him down on that Damascus road. And I thought about this the first time in his life. Saul is really praying. For the first time in his life, he's really praying. He had prayed ritual by ritual time and time again, over and over again. He kept everything just so-so. But for the first time in his life, really, really, truly, he is praying and he knows who he's praying to. Wow, he is undone. No doubt that he was thinking about all the things that he'd done through his life. I, don't, I can't imagine all the things that went through his mind that day, but you'll remember that it was Paul who said in the scriptures, oh, wretched man that I am. It was him that said, I am the chief of sinners. He must have been thinking about all those things. In those three days where, where nothing would satisfy him. He wouldn't eat. He wouldn't even drink anything. He had one purpose on his mind. I've got to know God truly. Whatever his purpose in my life is, I want to know the will of God. I want to do the will of God. Whatever it takes, that's what I want to do. Food won't satisfy, drink won't satisfy, people's, people's uh, praises won't satisfy, nothing will satisfy me at this point. I must know more of this God that I have just met along the way at Damascus Road. I must know Jesus Christ more and more. I must draw nearer to him. I must know his purpose and his will in my life. I am undone. I am undone and behold, he prayeth. Remember that it was Jesus that said, Behold, he prayeth. Those prayers went up to the ears of Jesus. There was an emergency going on. Behold, he prayeth. This was his emergency. Grieving over his sins, no doubt. Desiring to know God truly and fully. Desiring his true purpose for his life. I have to ask you tonight, have you ever been undone? Have you ever reached a place where you have come to the end of yourself? Have you ever reached a place where, where nothing will satisfy you except to know God? To have more of Him? Have you gone to the cross of Calvary and seen your sin upon the cross? See, Paul knew the grace of God had saved him. And all those sins were forgiven. Paul brought us that great message of grace in the scriptures. He tells us about it. He goes in depth with it. Why? Because he had experienced it for himself. The grace of Jesus Christ. 
But have you ever been undone? Have you ever came to that place where you've seen yourself in the light of Jesus Christ? That's what happened to Saul that day on the Damascus Road. He's seen who he was in the light of who Jesus is. Has that happened to you? Has it? Have you been to that place of holy desperation where nothing will satisfy? Oh, God, I've got to know you. I want to tell you that that he was in that place. Now, I want you to know that God's servant was dispatched. God's servant was dispatched. Uh, I, used to, I used to work in law enforcement, and you'd get a call, a 911 call would come in. They would say, uh, such and such locate. They would call your number and say, there's a, you know, a disturbance at such and such location. They would dispatch you. Go over there. The caller calls in. Their name is, is John. You'll be meeting with them just outside the residence. Something like that. There's a dispatch call that comes in. And so Paul, he is in there praying, and he is praying, and the Lord Jesus hears that, and, the, and God's servant is dispatched to him. Listen to what it says in verses 10 through 12. Let's read it again now in this light as we come back to where we started. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias... And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarshish. For behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. The call details the 911 dispatch that is sent out to Ananias. He says, The street is called Straight. That's where you're going. The house number is the house of Judas. And the caller is Saul of Tarshish. And he says, by the way, he knows you're coming. He knows you're coming. I want you to realize that as God's children, God can do this with each and every one of you that is serving him. God can send you to somebody to speak a word of encouragement to them, to, to strengthen them, to help them. Uh, there's many different number of ways that God can lay someone on your heart just to pray for them. God can do any number of different things. He can dispatch you and he'll say, he's going to call your number and he say, by the way, you need to go see this person. You need to go do this. This is where it's at. This is who it is. Go do this. Pray for them. God can dispatch you. And he will. Now I want you to notice what man sees. Verses 13 and 14. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. Ananias, and, and I would have been no different, said, Lord, are we talking about the same Saul of Tarsus? We are, okay. Have you heard of what he's been doing lately? Did you know that he has the legal authority to do the things that he's coming here to do? What man sees? Listen to what God sees. Verses 15 and 16. But the Lord said unto him, go thy way. He is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. God says, never mind that. Go on. He's my chosen vessel. Go your way. When God sends us to somebody, we may say, Lord, really? I got to do that? I mean, it's not always roses and good time. God may say, go do this. And we say, really, that's what you want me to do? And God says, go your way. Best be going. I would hate to think what would happen if Ananias would have said, no, I ain't going, Lord. Could you imagine that? But we don't know too much more about Ananias other than we get this account of what he's done. He's mentioned uh, maybe a time or two in other places. But could you, can you see... What an impact this man Ananias made being used of God. 
All the things that, that, that Paul had done in the course of his ministry, and Ananias was sent to kickstart this off. Wow. You never know who you're going to visit. You never know who God's sending you to. You never know what the end result of that is. You never know. Listen to the power of God, the power of God in an obedient service, 17 through 20. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hand on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. He was identified with Jesus, by the way, there. He was baptized, and when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then, Saul was, then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Wow. And he didn't hesitate to go. He went his way. The Lord gave him that assurance. Ananias, go your way. And it said he went. And he comes in and he says, Brother Saul, the Lord sent me unto you. I could just, could you just imagine how his heart would have leapt for joy in that moment. He's been three days in prayer, no food or drink or anything. And the vision that he's seen sometime during that time as he was praying... The door opens, there's Ananias, just like Jesus said. Just like Jesus said. Now I want you to notice the testimony as we come to the conclusion of the message. Just have a few more things to mention here. Are you still with me tonight? The testimony of a new creation, this is a changed man. Look at verse 20. He testifies of who changed his life. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God. He says, listen up everybody. I was originally coming to your building today to take some of you out violently and kill you. But instead I have a different message. Jesus saved me. <laughs> Jesus changed me. He is the son of God. That was his message he came in with. He went to that place, that synagogue, and he said, Jesus is Lord. He's the Son of God. He changed my life. He transformed me. I met him along the way. See, Paul loved to tell his story of what Jesus had done in his life. No doubt he told him. He said, Jesus, he struck me down on a Damascus road. I was coming here to arrest you guys and take you back to Jerusalem. I had the authority to do it, but all of a sudden, Jesus looked at me, and I couldn't even stand up. I was blind, and then Ananias came in. I got my sight back. I I was filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm a transformed, changed man. Jesus is the Son of God, and you need to follow him too. Look at this fact that is an undeniable, clear change in verse 21. But all that heard him were amazed. They were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem? And he came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest. They were amazed. Wow. It was an unmistakable change in his life. They said, Is this not he that destroyed them? It is. Paul probably said, it's me. Blink again, it's me. Verse 22, this is continuing in faith. Continuing in the faith, but Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelled at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. I love this because he received this new purpose in his life. His old mission was a mission of fear and death. That was his old mission. That was his old life. That's what he lived for. And it's been transformed into a message of hope and life because of Jesus Christ. His mission of fear and death is transformed into a mission of hope and life. Wow. 
Continuing in the faith, he increased more in strength. In recounting his testimony to King Agrippa, listen to this, uh, this, uh, what he says here in Acts chapter 26, verse 19 and 20. It says, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem, and throughout all the coast of Judea, then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God to do works meet for repentance. This was much later in his ministry. He stands before a king in chains and he says, I was not disobedient to the Lord Jesus Christ when he told me to go, and here I am. So that brings me to the conclusion of this. Are you able to share this same sort of testimony in your life? You may not have been knocked out, out, you know, you may not have been knocked down on the street up on Commercial Street or something with a light around you. But do you have a testimony of, of who changed your life? Has Jesus changed your life? Is there an undeniable change in your life that others can witness? These people seen Saul and they were amazed at what had happened. This is the same guy? Are you serious? Is there an undeniable change in your life? Are you continuing in the faith? Some people spring up joyful. Whoa, yeah. I'm all in. And two weeks later, they're all out. Are you continuing in the faith? Can you testify to someone else and say, Jesus changed my life? There's an undeniable clear change and I'm continuing in the faith. I will never turn back to the way that I was. Have you received a revelation of who Jesus is? That's the question. Have you came to the end of yourself? Has your life changed? Are you continuing in the faith? See, I want you to know tonight that that if, you've ne if, if you can't say that you've ever had that revelation of who Jesus is, then you need to be born again. If you've never come to the place where you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God that died on Calvary's cross, He shed His blood so that your sins could be forgiven. He paid the penalty uh, for your sins on the cross of Calvary. Uh, he shed His blood for you. He was buried. He was, uh, he, uh, was in, the, in the tomb. He rose again from the grave. He, he has ascended to heaven. He's seated at the right hand of the Father tonight. If you've never had the revelation and believe in your heart, that Jesus died for you, rose from the grave. You need to be born again. And if you have, then you'll have that testimony. It may not be grand and, and extravagant, but you may just, in a simple prayer, say, Lord Jesus, forgive me. I believe. And was grieved in your heart for your sin and realized that he died for you. That he rose again from the grave. And God can transform your life in an instant. Without Christ, you are in the greatest emergency of all emergencies. Saul had an emergency because he, he had to know. He had to have more. He had to know God. He had to know the purpose in his life. He, there was so much that had happened. He was in, a, in an emergency there. But he had, he had trusted Jesus as his Savior at that point. He had believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he received that born-again experience. But if you never had that revelation of who Jesus is, then you're in the greatest emergency of all emergencies. Your soul is on the line. And so God speaks to you, and he calls you, and he dispatches people to you to tell about their testimony, to share what God's done in their life. He brings you to a service and, and has you listen to a message of his word to tell you that he loves you, that he died for you, that he rose again from the grave. He calls to you, and he says, come. And in another way, he's revealing himself to you. Just like he did for Saul, just in another way. He'll reveal that, that glorious light of the gospel of Jesus Christ and it'll be shed abroad in your heart. 
That's what Jesus does. So there are some, and this is the last scripture that I'll read tonight before we open the altars. There are some that say, I don't understand how this could happen. I don't understand how, if you knew who I was right now, you, you wouldn't be speaking this way. I'm here to tell you, if, if God can change Saul of Tarshish, this, this wicked man that he was, this murderous, vile creature that he was, if God can change him and God did whatever it was necessary to bring him to him, by the way, God will do the same for you and God can change your life forever and completely. There's that verse in Ezekiel 36, verse 26. It says, a new heart also will I give you, a new spirit will I put within you and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. He'll give us that Holy Spirit. He'll born us again. He'll change us. He'll give us a heart transplant. He'll put the love of Jesus Christ inside of you. He will, put, he will take out that stony heart and he'll give you a new heart. He did it for me. There are others in this room that would raise their hand and say he did it for me. Has he done it for you? Praise God. We're going to give an invitation. Go ahead and come forward. So you may be in an emergency for your soul. Tonight's the night you can change that. Tonight's the night you can change that. All you have to do is be obedient to that call. Paul said, I was not disobedient to that heavenly vision. As God calls you tonight, will you be disobedient to that call? There are others that may be in a place of desperation. You've been born again, but you've got to know God more. Maybe you've never received that baptism of the Holy Spirit. It makes all the difference in the world. Saul received that baptism of the Holy Ghost when Ananias came and laid his hands on him. He got his sight back. And he was equipped for testimony and service for the Lord Jesus Christ. From that day forward, he was out there doing it. He didn't quit until the end of his life when the ax came down and he lost his head for the cause of Christ. So there may be a holy desperation building up inside of you that says, I've got to spend that time in prayer seeking God. I'm not what I want to be. I've got to know Him more. I've got to know His purpose in my life. I've got to know more of Jesus Christ. I've got to have that swelling up inside of me. I want to serve Him. Whatever your emergency may be, you can bring it to the altars tonight. Stand with me. These altars are open for you. I